Hello and welcome to Word Magazine. This is Jeff Riddle, pastor of Christ Reformed Baptist Church in Louisa, Virginia. Today is Saturday, October the 17th of 2020. In this episode of Word Magazine number 179, I'm going to be responding to four of James White's internal arguments against the authenticity of the traditional ending of Mark. Uh, It's the two-week mark, I guess, since the two debates that I had with James White. They were held back on October the 2nd. We debated Mark 16, 9 through 20, and then October the 3rd, Ephesians 3, 9. Uh, I offered on my blog, jeffriddle.net, several post-debate follow-ups, questions, including several that got traction and were discussed, including uh, responding, being responded to by James White on his Dividing Line podcast. Uh, probably the most notable of those was one that I called the two most striking or shocking things that James White said in the midst of our debate. Uh, they were, first of all, that he uh, called the traditional ending of Mark, Mark 16, 9 through 20, an unorthodox corruption and I pointed out how that would just dismantle the entirety of the doctrine of preservation. Uh, this was this would be a very radical position. Even somebody like Bruce Metzger and modern uh, per- persons like uh, Peter Gurry, although they don't think that Mark 16, 9 through 20 was original, they still think it's canonical uh, following the tradition of Samuel Tregellis. But uh, James White takes a a radical view and says that not only is it spurious and not original, but it is unorthodox, that it includes theology that is corrupt. And um, if that's the case, then he ought to be leading the charge to rip these portions of uh, Mark out of our printed Gospels, our printed New Testaments, printed Bibles. Um, The second very shocking thing that he said was really that we can't be certain about any verse within the Bible, that every verse is subject to change based on modern archaeological discoveries of manuscripts that might overturn any passage, any verse within the Bible. And what this leads to in the end is complete instability. It, It cuts Uh, completely undercuts the epistemological foundations for Christianity. And uh, so those were the two most shocking things that he said. Um, I do want to say I appreciate the support, encouragement that I received both before the debate, the debates that I had with James White, and the encouragement responses that I've received from people since that time. Um, I think anyone who viewed the two debates, and in particular the first one, the debate on Mark 16, 9 through 20, I think you can probably see now why James White was very hesitant to enter into that debate. And uh, you may remember I did several um, podcasts where I was asking the question, why won't James White debate Mark 16, 9 through 20? Uh, And we can see why he was hesitant to defend uh, his position because I think that it is an indefensible position. And I think many, many people sort of had their eyes opened to see that um, Mark 16, 9 through 20 can very ably, um, uh, reasonably be defended as original and authentic. And in fact, there are um, very significant doctrinal, theological, and historical problems that arise if we uh, take the position that someone like James White does, uh, something like the position of James White, that Mark 16, 9 through 20 is not original or authentic. I, I said before, I think on this podcast, that honestly I was surprised uh, that he was willing to defend the resolution that Mark 16, 9 through 20 is not original, it's not inspired, it should not be received as the word of God. I was the one who proposed that as the resolution, and I, and I thought he would nuance that a little bit, Um, But I I was surprised he was willing to take the affirmative on that resolution. He did, and I think you see the results in the debate that we had. Um, I wanted to follow up today. I didn't do an after-debate review podcast 
didn't have time to do it. Like I said, I did several written responses on my blog, but I wanted to do a sort of a follow-up. And I don't want to do this forever and ever. I don't want to talk about the debates that I had with James White in the same way he talks about the debate, that he, the, the, the joint appearance he had with Bart Ehrman 11 years ago. My goodness, even in, even in the conversation two weeks ago, if I heard Bart Ehrman's name one more time, even though I raised his name a couple of times, raising it ironically that um, James White has actually embraced the, the um, textual position of Bart Ehrman, but I promise I'm not going to continue to talk about the time I debated, you know, in the public square, uh, out in the real world when I debated James White uh, on the text of Scripture. Um, but I think there are uh, some salient points that need to be followed up on uh, from this debate. And, um, you know, uh, one of the things is, you know, James White uh, put forward this, this gospel tract theory. Uh, that I had never heard before, and we didn't get much of a chance to discuss that. Maybe we will at some point. It seems like an extremely speculative overreach to try to give some justification for how one could possibly believe that Mark could have originally ended at Mark 16.8. As I pointed out in the debate, um, in my conclusion, James White never responded to one of the most damning internal arguments against his position, the idea that, that Mark could end at Mark 16.8 because it would lead to a grammatical monstrosity, that is, uh, having the gospel end with the post-positive particle gar. Uh, this would be like having uh, a gospel end with uh, the word for dot, 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 or therefore dot, dot, dot. Um, and as I pointed out, uh, the idea that Mark could have ended at Mark 16.8 originally is an idea that really only surfaced in the late 20th century under the influence of new literary criticism. And uh, Mark, as I said in the debate, is not Kafka. Um, in, in this episode, I want to follow up on uh, some other internal arguments uh, made by James White. Again, when we talk about a text um, in the New Testament that is disputed. Often we will talk about the external evidence. What do we find in the extant manuscripts? What do we find in the church fathers? What do we find in the versional or the, the witnesses, the translations, the early translations? And then um, we talk about the internal evidence, the language, the vocabulary, the context, uh, syntax, etc. And then uh, we can also talk about, you know, larger theological, canonical issues as well. But um, I want to follow up and address some uh, more issues related to internal evidence that we didn't have time to talk about. And in preparing for the debate with James White, I had um, uh, sketched out some notes for what I was going to say in the rebuttal anticipating some of the things that he would say. And I wasn't able to use all the notes. I was able to use some of them. And I thought, well, why don't I just uh, share some of the information I wasn't able to share during the debate because there wasn't time. Um, and uh, in my preparation for the debate, to sort of anticipate what the internal arguments were going to be that James White would raise, I, I tried to look and see if he had written anything on Mark 16, 9 through 20. As I pointed out a number of times, actually, when you start looking at uh, James White's body of literature, he's actually written, published very little in the field of text criticism. He has the, 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 the King James Version only controversy book, but that's really about the King James Version as a translation. Um, he did, in his 2009 second edition or revision of it, he added a, 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 an appendix um, uh, titled, I think, Questions and Answers. Uh, it begins on page 297, where he gave, gives very short attention to a handful of passages and address some of the textual issues. Um, other than the King James Version only controversy, he has, hasn't really written anything on text criticism. He's not published any journal articles, book reviews of 
noteworthy works in the field of text criticism. Most of his writing has been in other areas. And um, uh, I, I know it, it kind of irks him, but it's just a reality. I, know, I think Bart Ehrman, <laughs> to raise Bart Ehrman's name again, 11 years ago pointed out uh, in their debate that he really didn't have much that James, Wright, James White had written on text criticism that he could respond to. And, um, but anyways, in this 2009 revision of the King James Version Only controversy, he does give a handful of pages to the ending of Mark. Uh, and this is on pages 316 uh, through page 320. So it's about four and a half, five pages here. And it's under the title, Mark 16, 9 through 20, and the endings, plural, of Mark. And that has a kind of a postmodern uh, ring to it. And uh, he discusses here some of the external evidence. But again, what I want to focus on uh, in this podcast is some of what he says in uh, the King James Version only controversy appendix or questions and answers chapter about the internal evidence. And I figured that he would probably mention some of these things. And in fact, he did. I responded to some of them some of them briefly, some of them in a more extended way. But again, I thought it might be interesting to review this and share with you some of my extended notes and even a few extra quotations on a few things. So I'm honing in on uh, what he writes on pages 318 to 320, where he lists uh, four uh, what he calls anomalies. Uh, within the traditional ending of Mark, Mark 16, 9 through 20, that supposedly would prove that Mark 16, 9 through 20 is not authentic, not original. And as we now know from the debate, um, he would argue that these are even unorthodox, that they are, that they are not only spurious, but they are, they are wrong and dangerous in theology. So uh, again, he, he, he mentions four issues. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through these four. I'm going to read what he says, and then I'm going to offer a, a, a few responses. So let's see. The first anomaly, this is page 318. He said, this is James White writing. He says, the first anomaly is found in verse 12, Mark 16, 12. Jesus is said to appear in a different form, and he gives uh, the Greek Ephane rothe in hetera morphe uh, to two disciples, most probably the two on the road to Emmaus, Luke 24, 13 through 35. It must be admitted that different form could refer to the two disciples being supernaturally kept from recognizing the Lord until he had broken bread with them. And he cites uh, Luke 24, 16, Luke 24, 31. This phrase seems unusual, though, as it tends to make one think Jesus could change his form at will. With the extreme care taken by the other gospel writers to ensure that all would know Jesus rose physically from the grave, this seems out of place and inconsistent. So this is the first uh, internal argument that he raises in uh, this very brief discussion of the ending of Mark. Uh, it's, again, this phrase in verse 12 that Jesus appeared to the two disciples in another form. And uh, I, again, didn't get a chance to respond to that uh, in detail, even though I had some notes. And let me just share to you with you um, some of what I wrote responding to that argument. Uh, so uh, I didn't get a chance to share. I said, is this statement really so unusual. I mean, James White says, this phrase seems unusual as it tends to make one think Jesus could change his form at will. So again, Mark 16, 12 uh, says, after that he appeared in another form unto two of them as they walked and went into the country. Is that really so unusual? When Mark says that the Lord Jesus appeared to these disciples in another form, is he not simply saying that Christ appeared to them in his resurrection body? And Christ has, has undergone the resurrection. He was dead and is now alive. Um, and is this not a theme 
that is found throughout the Gospels that the disciples do not always immediately recognize the Lord Jesus in this new state, in this new form, in the resurrection body. Does not Luke say the same in his more extended description of that event in Luke 24 when he says that the, when the two disciples met the Lord, the risen Lord, on the road to Emmaus, in Luke 24, 16, it says, But their eyes were holden that they should not know him. And Mark's description then is, is consistent with that. And also, if you think about the Gospel of John, the Lord Jesus appears to Mary Magdalene, and she doesn't immediately recognize him as the risen Christ. She thinks he's the gardener until he calls her by name. And when he calls her by name, if you look at John 20, verse 15 to 16, then she recognizes him. It also is completely fitting with the description we have of Christ's appearance to the seven disciples on the shore of the Sea of Tiberias in John 21, in which they do not immediately recognize him. John 21, 4, uh, at the very end of that verse says, but they knew not that it was Jesus. So Mark 16, verse 12, is consistent with this phenomenon of the disciples not immediately recognize Jesus, recognizing Jesus in his resurrection body. It also seems consistent with Paul's statements about the resurrection body that are found in places like 1 Corinthians 15, where in verse 44, Paul says there is a natural body, and there is a spiritual body. Or when he says in verse 53, for this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality. To this, we can add Paul's statement in 2 Corinthians 5, 16. Wherefore, henceforth, know we no man after the flesh. Yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet henceforth know we him no more. Um, so I think Paul, what Paul was saying was we don't know Christ as he was in his, uh, in his form during his earthly ministry when the word had become flesh and dwelt among us. Now we know him as inhabiting his resurrection body. And uh, that, that verse, uh, th those passages and statements from Paul were the point of a lot of dispute in early Christianity, in particular by Origen, who denied the bodily resurrection of Christ and said it was just a spiritual resurrection. But the Orthodox uh, believers who opposed Origen uh, would say, no, it was a bodily resurrection, but the resurrection body was in a different form than the form of the body that Christ inhabited before his uh resurrection experience. And so um, the point is that Mark 16, 12 is not unorthodox. It's not an unorthodox corruption. It is instead consistent with what we read about in the other gospels. It's consistent with what we read about in Paul. And thus we can say it's consistent with the so-called rule of faith. Um, and so anyways, this, this, this first internal argument that uh, James White makes in um, the King James only version controversy uh, about the Gospel of Mark and its traditional ending, I think, is uh, an improper uh, argument. Uh, the second of the four arguments that he makes uh, in that writing on uh, the internal arguments about the ending of Mark, traditional ending of Mark, focuses on uh, Mark 16, verse 14. And let me once again read for you exactly what James White says so we can understand uh, his argument in context. He writes, this is page 319, the second problem crops up in verse 14 where we have 11 disciples reclining at the table. Aside from the possible numerical problem, was not Thomas absent? Here we are told that Jesus reproached them for their unbelief and hardness of heart. This is out of character given the other accounts of his dealings with the disciples after the resurrection. It is so strong that at least one scribe felt it needed toning down, 
and introduce the 90-word interpolation preserved today by Codex W. So that's the end of his comments. So um, let me just read for you what it says in Mark 16, 14. Mark 16, 14 reads, Afterward he appeared unto the eleven as they sat at meat, and upbraided them with their unbelief and hardness of heart, because they believed not them which had seen him after he was risen. And so uh, James White is saying the whole idea of, of the risen Christ reproaching the disciples for their unbelief and hardness of heart is not consistent with perhaps what we're reading in the other Gospels or what else we find in Mark. Um, and we could dismiss a couple things. The disciples are sometimes referred to as the twelve when, or, or as the eleven when not all of the twelve or the eleven are present. So we can immediately dismiss that part of it. We can also immediate, immediately dismiss his theory about this is the reason why the interpolation developed in Codex Washingtoniensis. Um, that's a speculation. I've, I've never heard anyone suggest that, that it was to counter uh, Mark 16, 14's account of Christ upbraiding the disciples for their unbelief. Um, but really at the core is, I think, White's misguided argument against um, the content of Mark 16, 14, and the stress that after his resurrection, Christ would upbraid the disciples for their unbelief and hardness of heart. And so let me share with you uh, some of my notes that I didn't get to share uh, in the debate. Um, let's see, I wrote... Uh, my opponent says that this is out of character given the other accounts of his dealings with the disciples after the resurrection. Contrary to what my opponent has said, this description seems to be among the most Markan elements that we find in the traditional ending. One of the central themes throughout Mark is discipleship. And if you read, sit down and read the Gospel of Mark, you will find that throughout the entire narrative, Christ has been correcting and exhorting the disciples to overcome their unbelief. And let me just cite a few examples. If you look at Mark chapter 3, verse 5, this is the account of Christ healing the man with the withered hand. It says, Mark 3, 5, And when he, that is Jesus, looked around, uh, looked around about on them with anger, being grieved for the hardness of their hearts. And we're to assume that the disciples were there in that crowd. So he was grieved at the hardness of their hearts. Uh, in Greek, it's epite porosai tes cardias auton. And it's using the, the noun he porosis for their dullness or the hardness of their hearts. Um, then in Mark chapter 6, there's the account of the Lord Jesus walking on the waves to the disciples. In Mark 6.50, he says to them, Be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. And then Mark offers this explanation in Mark 6, verse 52, uh, concerning the disciples. He writes, For they considered not the miracle of the loaves, for their heart was hardened. And uh, in Greek, it's he cardia auton pepo romane. And here it's using uh, the verb porao to be dull or to be hardened. But it's got the, the noun there, he cardia uh, auton. Their heart was hardened or dull. So Christ is warning the disciples about the leaven of the Pharisees, the leaven of Herod in Mark chapter 7, verse 15, and the disciples think he is angry because they had no bread. This is another example in Mark 8, 17. Christ asked them, Have ye your heart yet hardened? And once again, it uses the, um, the, the verb porao, um, do you have your heart hardened? So, so you see, this is a theme throughout Mark's gospel. Early on, um, during Christ's earthly ministry, he's often upbraiding the disciples for 
their lack of belief, and their hardness of heart. In Mark 8, verse 33, uh, Christ uh, turns and looks at the disciples, and he rebukes Peter, saying, Get thee behind me, Satan, for thou savorest not the things that be of God, but the things that be of men. And in Mark chapter 16 and verse 14, again, uh, Christ talks about, uh, or there's a reference there to the hardness of heart of the disciples, and it uses a distinct term, sclerocardia. And if we look at Mark chapter 10, verse 5, uh, Christ uh, answers those who are asking about his teaching on divorce, and he says, for the hardness of your heart he wrote to you this precept, and there it uses this very same term, sclerocardia. So the language of Mark 16, 14, particularly the use of sclerocardia, is consistent with what is used elsewhere in Mark, where the exact same term is used in Mark 10, 5. It's also consistent with the theme of discipleship. The disciples have a problem with hardness of their cardia, their heart, uh, with respect to belief in Jesus. And this theme continues in the immediate aftermath of Christ's resurrection, when the disciples do not believe the reports that have come to them from those like Mary Magdalene, those like the two disciples to whom Christ appeared in another form. They do not believe the reports. And the point is very consistent with what we read in the, in the rest of Mark is that the, the, the disciples only slowly come to realize uh, who Jesus is. And in this case, they only slowly come to realize that he has been raised from the dead as he had predicted and as he had taught. Now, is that inconsistent with what we, uh, again, to this point, I think I've proven, it's not inconsistent with Mark. It's very consistent with the theme of discipleship in Mark, the, the slowness of the disciples to perceive who Jesus is, what he's accomplished. But is it inconsistent with what we, we read in the other Gospels? Not at all. In Matthew chapter 28, verse 17, after the resurrection of Jesus, Matthew records, and when they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. And in Luke chapter 24, verse 25, Christ exhorts the disciples on the road to Emmaus, O fools and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. So what do we find in Matthew, in Luke, and in Mark, this theme of even after the resurrection, that some of the disciples are slow to believe because of their hardness of heart. And so, um, again, the second objection on internal grounds uh, is one that does not hold in the end. It can easily be disproven. The third um, of the four internal arguments that James White makes in the King James Only Controversy Appendix in his 2009 revision uh, revolves around the statement that's made in Mark 16, 16. And so let me... uh, Uh, look at that one next. This is on page 319 in the King James Version Only Controversy 2009 edition. He writes, the next issue is in verse 16. The conjunction of baptism and belief is unusual to say the least. In no other passage does Jesus tie these things together so intricately. Now, Jesus does then go on to say that the basis for condemnation is unbelief, not lack of baptism, And hence, baptism does not, even on the basis of this passage, have saving power. But it still presents a a phrase out of character with what we know of his teaching from Mark's gospel as well as the other accounts. So the issue here, again, is Mark 16, 16. Let me just read it again. Mark 16, 16. Christ says, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. And again, the issue that James White takes up with this is that it is supposedly out of character with Mark, as well as other accounts. Presumably, he means by this the rest of the New Testament. Maybe this would be another passage where he would claim that that the view in the traditional ending is unorthodox. 
But uh, if this passage is rightly divided, rightly interpreted, and Scripture, of course, must interpret Scripture, is this passage uh, incomprehensible? Is it completely illogical and unfitting with what we find in the rest of the Scriptures? Surely, this passage must be interpreted in the light of other passages, like Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, For by grace you save through faith, not by works. Uh, once we place Mark 16, 16 alongside of Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, we understand, and it dispels any notion that any uh, Orthodox gospel writer would have argued that the work of baptism would produce regeneration and that it, that it would save someone. In fact, we might even argue linguistically in Mark 16, 16, it says, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. But when it talks about the one who believes not shall be damned, it doesn't say he that believeth not and is not baptized will be damned. And so we can understand that the baptism is not the thing that is essential to salvation, but it is the believing. But even, I think, more confirming that James White has misinterpreted Mark 16, 16 is the fact that if we look at Acts 2.38, Peter's uh, preaching at Pentecost, we find a very similar statement made by Peter, where Peter says, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. Now, again, using the principle of Scripture interpreting Scripture, if we lay Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 by this, and we think that Scripture is coherent, then you know, we don't think that this passage teaches the necessity of baptism for salvation. But um, we, we think that baptism is something that is for those who are saved, who believe, who are justified by faith. It's not the thing that saves, but the thing that accompanies in normal circumstances the one who confesses faith in Christ. Uh, now, indeed, there have been people who have taken passages like this, I think, out of context and have misinterpreted it those who are, are Campbellites, those in the Disciples of Christ movement who believe that, that baptism is necessary for salvation, uh, or even those in, in you know, some other traditions who believe in baptismal regeneration might think that this is what it says. But we would say, with all due respect, no, that's not what this teaches. And so, anyways, uh, James White's premise here that Mark 16, 16 says something that's completely out of, out of keeping with what we read in the rest of the Bible is untrue. It's there in Acts 2.38, the same sentiment. But really, more importantly, it has to be um, rightly divided, rightly interpreted to be understood within the context of the entirety of the teaching of the New Testament. So um, it's in no way a defeater on internal grounds uh, for the authenticity of the traditional ending of Mark. Um, the fourth and last internal argument that James White takes up uh, in uh, this brief five pages that he writes about the ending of Mark, as far as I know, the only thing that he's written has published about the ending of Mark, um, relates to verses 17 and 18. Let me just read the paragraph from page 319. He writes, verses 17 and 18 present yet another problem. The signs given here are promised to accompany those who have believed, seemingly to all who have believed. This again has no real counterpart in any other passage. Certainly Paul was bitten by a serpent and felt no ill effects, but even that story does not remove Christians from the natural consequences of life. A person can be bitten by a poisonous serpent and suffer no harm due to the snake not releasing any venom, not an uncommon occurrence. Possibly Paul's experience shows God's sovereignty over creation and his control even over animal life more than it shows Paul's ability to be poisoned and yet survive. These verses are reminiscent of many apocryphal writings that were circulating after the close of the New Testament period. And that's the end of his paragraph on uh, verses 17 and 18. Now this one I did address, I did bring up uh, in the debate, and we had some discussion of it. We'll talk about that in a moment. But um, it's interesting what he says here. He wants to uh, argue against the authenticity of the traditional ending of Mark based on what is said 
in verses 17 and 18. And again, let me just read this. Um, Christ says, verses 17 and 18, And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name they shall cast out devils, they shall speak with new tongues, they shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. And uh, I made the point in the debate that the, the proper way to understand this passage is that the Lord Jesus is addressing here the disciples. He's addressing the 11. And the teaching here is not for all Christians in all ages, but it is specifically for the apostles in the apostolic age. And uh, James White seemed astounded by that. He seemed as though he had never considered that, never thought about it, which is kind of strange because he's willing to take a dogmatic stand against the authenticity of Mark 16, 9 through 20. And he lists this passage as one reason why he rejects it. And apparently he even believes perhaps it's unorthodox in some, in some way. Uh, but he seemed astounded that he, he seems never to have considered the possibility that this passage is addressed to the apostles. And also the point that I was raising was if we remove Mark 16, 9 through 20 from the New Testament, as James White wishes to do, we have removed from the scriptures one of the passages that is most important for the argument for what is known as cessationism, the argument that there were the sign gifts that were given to the apostles for use in the apostolic age, but that with the passing of the original apostles, that those signs are no longer ordinarily operative uh, in the life of the church, although the Lord can do certainly in his sovereignty as he pleases with respect to uh, performing miracles. Um, again, I think if you look at Mark 16, 9 through 20, it seems clear to me that you must understand that Christ is addressing in verses 17 and 18 the 11 as I pointed out in the debate afterward he appeared unto the 11 as they sat at meat and he upbraided them with their unbelief their apistia um, and their hardness of heart their sclerocardia because they believed not them which had seen him after he was risen they did not Pistoio, believe or trust in the, those who brought reports of his resurrection appearances. And um, the, the verb pistoio can have multiple meanings. It can mean saving faith, but it can also mean trust or sort of factual knowledge belief. Uh, in the book of James, James says that even the demons believe in God and shudder. It's not talking about saving faith, but it's talking about um, knowledge, trust, understanding. And um, then uh, in verses, uh, um, verse 20, it says, And they, meaning the eleven, went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them, and confirming the word with signs following. And so again, to read it in context, this teaching is not some kind of um, obscure, wild um, uh, teaching about snake handling, etc. It's talking about the signs that were given to the apostles. As I did get a, a chance to point out during the debate, if you look at the five signs, every one of them finds some corresponding fulfillment um, or at least some corresponding passage within the rest of the New Testament to support it. Casting out devils uh, is mentioned as the first of the, of the signs in verse 17. If you turn over to Acts 16, you find that Paul will um, exercise, cast out demons from the slave girl of Philippi who has the pithic spirit and uh, this will result in Paul and Silas being cast into prison and singing uh, praising God and praying at midnight um, and then eventually results in the conversion of the Philippian jailer but all that starts with him casting out the pithic spirit 
the demon from the, the slave girl of Philippi. Um, verse 17 talks about speaking with new tongues. Well, the apostles will do this at Pentecost uh, in Acts 2. Taking up serpents, I've already uh, mentioned uh, also in the debate and in Acts 28, 1 through 6, when Paul is shipwrecked on Melita or Malta, he's bitten by a snake and shakes it off in the fire, and the people who see this are, uh, are amazed uh, that, that he could do this. Um, uh, the drinking of any deadly thing in verse 18, I noted this is the only one that doesn't have a clear fulfillment in the book of Acts. But I pointed to Christ's words in Luke 10, 19. Behold, I give unto you the power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. And this is spoken to the disciples. And it's interesting that it couples together uh, treading upon serpents and scorpions with um, uh, not being hurt uh, by any um, power of the enemy. Nothing will hurt you. And then we find this interesting combination in Mark 16, 17, 18 of taking up snakes and drinking any deadly thing. Uh, and then uh, last, the fifth sign, laying hands on the sick so that they might recover. Uh, that's in Mark 16, 18. Peter will do this in Acts 9 when he heals Aeneas, who had been sick for eight years of palsy. Um, we might say Paul will do this in Acts 20 at Troas when he lifts up Eutychus who fell uh, what it would have been to maybe to his death or to great injury. And so there is laying hands on the sick so that they might recover. And so all these things find fulfillment uh, within the book of Acts. Um, is the traditional ending of Mark then inconsistent when it mentions signs being done by the apostles? Not at all. In 2 Corinthians 12, 12, Paul writes, Truly the signs of an apostle were wrought among you in all patience, in signs and wonders and mighty deeds. By the way, we might also point out that the noun signs, um, it's, a, it's a neuter noun, ta uh, semea, uh, semeon rather, it is part of Mark's vocabulary. The same term, the signs, is, or a sign, is used in Mark 13, verse 4, Mark 13, verse 22. But James White would have us believe that these references to signs, as he puts it, are reminiscent of many apocryphal writings circulating at the close of the New Testament. But when you look at the evidence, the, the mention of signs being done by the apostles is not apocryphal. It is New Testament usage. It is apostolic usage. Um, and then, uh, as I, I have pointed out after the debate, um, these things are pointed out by scholars, by various writers. Um, if, you, if you pick up and read um, Edward F. Hills, the King James Version Defended, uh, he makes reference to this. Uh, this is on page 168. He writes... It is sometimes said that the last 12 verses of Mark are not really important, so that it makes little difference whether they are accepted or rejected. This, however, is hardly the case. For Mark 16, 9 through 20 is the only passage in the Gospels which refers specifically to the subject which is attracting so much attention today, namely tongues, healings, and other spiritual gifts. The last verse of this passage is particularly decisive, Mark 16, 20. Here we see that the purpose of the miracles promised by our Lord was to confirm the preaching of the divine word by the apostles. Of course, then, these signs ceased after the apostles' death. Today, we have no need of them. The Bible is the all-sufficient miracle. And if we take this high view of the Bible, we cannot possibly suppose that the ending of one of the Gospels has been completely lost. That's the end of the quote from Hills. And so Hills is pointing out, this is a very valuable passage uh, supporting cessationism. And if we remove this, uh, we have removed a key a passage in support of cessationism. Um, again, uh, James White responded as though that this was a completely ridiculous idea. He acted as though he'd never heard about this before. And that's really amazing. In fact, um, I, I pulled down from my shelf uh, my commentaries on Mark and just looked at a couple of them. 
And uh, I pulled down, for example, William Hendrickson's commentary on Mark. And Hendrickson's New Testament commentaries are very popular, particularly with re Reformed folk. I don't always agree with Hendrickson in his interpretations, and particularly with his, his view of the text of the Bible. And I, in fact, I did a Word magazine on uh, Hendrickson's commentary on the ending of Mark. It's Word magazine 44. Uh, he doesn't believe in the authenticity, uh, originality of Mark 16, 9 through 20. But for our purposes here, it's interesting to read what he wrote about the, the so-called sign gifts in uh, Mark 16, 17, and 18. And this is from his commentary, Hendrickson's commentary on Mark, page 690. We find this paragraph. In connection with such special gifts, B.B. Warfield states, quote, These gifts were part of the credentials of the apostles as the authoritative agents of God in founding the church. They necessarily passed away with it, end quote. That, this is Hendrickson continuing, that with the passing away of the apostolic age, these gifts ceased is also the testimony of Chrysostom and Augustine. It was also the view of Jonathan Edwards. Quote, these extra gifts were given in order to the founding and establishing of the church in the world. But since the canon of scripture has been completed and the church fully founded and established, these extraordinary gifts have ceased, end quote. Um, Hendrickson continues, among others who express similar views are Matthew Henry, George Whitfield, Charles A. Spurgeon, Robert L. Dabney, Abraham Kuyper, Sr., and W.G.T. Shedd. So, uh, William Hendrickson, hmm, in his commentary, thinks that Mark 16, 17 through 18, even if he doesn't accept their authenticity, he says the content is relevant for the early Christian um, understanding of the cessation of the apostolic gifts. But James White acts as though that this is a completely uh, de novo argument that is being made. Um, someone uh, uh, on my blog in a comment pointed me toward a book by Peter Masters and John C. Whitcomb that is titled The Charismatic Illusion. And this book was uh, um, first published, let's see, in 1982. And there was a revised edition in 2016. And I ordered a copy of the book and I haven't read all of it yet, but I did look at uh, chapter 11, which is titled, What About the Signs of Mark 16? And so they're responding to how do you properly interpret the signs listed in Mark 16? And here is the conclusion that they reach. This is on pages 67 and 68. They write, to summarize, the key to the passage lies in Mark 16, 14. Afterward, he appeared unto the eleven and upbraided them with their unbelief and hardness of heart. The principal subject is the unbelief of the eleven and the Lord's special promises to them if they repent of this. We must therefore conclude that these words were specifically addressed to the eleven. And therefore, no present-day believers need feel guilty because they cannot heal the sick, triumph over venomous, uh, venomous snakes, and survive deadly poisons. And so, guess what? Unbelievable. Uh, Peter Masters, uh, the successor to uh, Spurgeon at uh, uh, the Tabernacle, uh, Metropolitan Tabernacle Church in London, and his co-author here, um, John C. Whitcomb, agree that Mark 16, verses 17 and 18, is relevant for the uh, cessationism argument, as did William Hendrickson, um, as did uh, um, Dr. Hills. So this is not an obscurantist position, and it's surprising to me that James White would act so surprised as though he's never heard this argument before. Perhaps he had never heard of it before, I'm wondering what kind of study he did on this passage before he took what I think is an extreme position and rejected it as an unorthodox corruption. Well, uh, that kind of covers the basis for this. Um, again, I wanted to just cover those 
four uh, internal arguments that James White posed in writing and maybe give some expanded uh, responses to them. Um, just one more comment before we go. Um, I, I looked back today before doing this, um, this podcast at uh, the posting on YouTube for that first debate, again, done two weeks ago now, and it's got nearly 19,000 views, and um, there are 381 comments, and I've not read all those comments, um, but I, I just looked at the, hit the newest first, you know, button to see what the newest comments were, and of course, there are a number of comments from people who say, oh, James White killed Riddle, Riddle fumbled here, fumbled there. Um, but I, many of the, the comments, though, I think are pointing out, hey, you know, wait a second, Riddle seemed to be able to, able to defend the traditional text. Maybe I wasn't expecting that, um, that there is a, a good argument in favor of the traditional text. And I just want to share uh, one of the comments, and this was just, just done according to the post here at YouTube yesterday. So it was just done, what, on October the 16th. And this person wrote, um, Jay Sanders wrote, uh, I have watched many Dr. James White debates. I was at the George Bryson slaughter. I saw him at the Doug Wilson LA airport debate. In all his debates, he always has a checkmate moment where, in my mind, he wins the debate. This is the first debate ever that I can say he lost. Yes, he lost this debate. No checkmate moment. Mr. Riddle was very well prepared and came across as a true defender of the faith. Well, thank you for that comment. And... Um, I'll leave it in the hands of the people who view the debate as to which side prevailed. I, I, I said, I think, toward the beginning of the debate that, um, you know, I was felt that, that my opponent, James White, was in an unenviable position because he was arguing against the originality, inspiration, and authenticity of Mark 16, 9 through 20. And I do believe that because it is the word of God, it will defend itself. It, it, it's not going to depend on the clever arguments of me or any other TR defender, but it will have a tenacity to it because it is God-breathed and it will defend itself. These internal arguments that I've covered, I think, give you reasonable grounds for affirming the authenticity of Mark 16, 9 through 20 whether it's these arguments or other internal arguments or external arguments that might be raised. However, I think in the end, the point is that if it is God's word, it will defend itself. And as I pointed out in the debate, this is not merely a naturalistic exercise. This is a super naturalistic exercise as God is at work to preserve and to defend his word. Well, this brings this episode of Word Magazine to an end. Hope that you have found at least some of this material to be helpful as I went through and sometimes stumbled through some of it. I hope it was um, coherent to some degree. And I will look forward to speaking to you in the next episode of Word Magazine. Till then, take care and God bless.